storm clouds. And you know, they come in a lot of different impressive uh, sizes and shapes. And, and, and now with the satellite images and technology that can see clouds from outer space, um, you know, they made the meteorologist's job a whole lot easier, more precise, since they can track these storms and, and calculate the, the wind speed and the temperature and the altitude and all those things. They have a better handle on predicting, forecasting the weather. Do you know that the Gospels recorded Jesus responding to some of the religious leaders about storm clouds? It's found in, or one of the accounts is found in Matthew 16, and I'd like us to look at the first four verses. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. They asked for a sign. They didn't get one. And if we keep looking at the context, verses 5 through 7, it says, Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Well, they didn't get it. He wasn't talking about bread. He repeated it in verse 11. How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Do you know that when you put leaven, you put yeast in a dough? It influences the whole batch. It permeates it. And, and so we need to investigate this response to them, why Jesus responded the way he did, and, and look at some of Jesus' other interaction with them so that we'll get a better understanding of their leaven, why Jesus warned his disciples not to be caught up in the leaven, the influence of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So, if we look back at this, we see that he said they could discern the natural signs, but not the sign of the times. They could discern the natural, but they couldn't discern the spiritual events that were happening almost continually as Jesus preached and ministered to the people. He called them a wicked and adulterous generation for seeking a sign in when we look at scripture, Psalm 78, 8, it declares this, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. These were those that came out of Egypt and then tempted God. They had been eating manna supplied by God, and yet they wanted quail. And they, they literally tempted and tested God. So that's what Jesus is accusing these folks of. And from the context of Matthew, we can see that they had plenty of opportunity to see Jesus do miracles, but they rejected it. They rejected him. Just if we were just to look back at Matthew 15, verses 30 through 31, it says, Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. All this was happening. It was right there. But this group wasn't there to glorify God. 
Jesus said to them that the sign of Jonah was the only sign they were going to get. Now, I, I think we're familiar. This is the prophet that spent three days in the belly of a whale. And then he was sent to Nineveh. Um, you know, that's a prophetic type. It's a shadow of the gospel. I want us to, to take note of what the Apostle Paul said about this. It's found in Corinthians 15, first four verses. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which, you, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel. Christ dead, buried, raised again. That's the type of Jonah. Buried three days. And do you know that both the Bible and history itself show that the Ninevites were a wicked, 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 I can't overstate it enough, wicked yes. people. I won't even tell you what history tells us about those people and what they did to the countries that they conquered. And that's how they made their living, living was going and taking other people's stuff. Maybe there's a few people like that in your neighborhood, so you know just a small glimpse of what it's like when people live by taking other people's stuff. It takes it to a whole new level when they come in and slaughter the whole town just to take their stuff. That's what they did. Jonah came with a message for them. Forty days, Nineveh will be overthrown. He came with a message of judgment. God's judgment's coming on you. Forty days, you won't be anymore. The people repented from the least to the greatest. Even the king repented for the gospel, the sign of Jonah, to benefit anyone with all its many blessings. They have to repent. They have to repent. And Jesus was talking to a bunch of religious folks that were not willing to do that. They weren't willing to repent. And so, as we continue to investigate these leaders in response to Jesus, I think that we'll begin to see more clearly the leaven Jesus warned about. And this is going to expose false and erroneous teaching that was then and still now. Because false and erroneous teaching hasn't went away. And, and so there's no misunderstanding of Jesus' appraisal of them and their rejection of him. Let's look back for a moment to Matthew 17, or excuse me, 15, and we'll look at verses 7 through 9 and then verse 12. They came to Jesus and were asking him, how come your disciples don't wash your hands. You know, they're blowing off the, the commandments. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And if we look at verse 12, Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? <laughs> now that, that shows us the kind of relationship they had. If we were to look in Matthew 23 at verse 15, we'll see what Jesus said publicly about them. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourselves. That's, that's the kind of relationship they had. Jesus was not pulling any punches. But let's look to the Gospel of John. And I want us to look at chapter 9. And I, I hope that we can see how categorically 
completely and categorically these leaders rejected Jesus. When we look at chapter 9 and we look at verses 10 through 13, remember Jesus had healed this man who had been born blind. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Then they brought him, who formerly was blind, to the Pharisees. So they brought him there. And now let's look at what happens next. Verses 20 through 34. His, they'd got his parents. His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. When they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already. You did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began... It has been unheard of that anyone open the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him and said to him, You are completely born in sins, and you are teaching us? And they cast him out. So if we begin to look at this, we see their reaction, we see their response, that in spite of the reality the evidence that this man who had been born blind now sees and testifies how it happens that Christ had done this, they cast him out. They cast him out. Their response, what they did, is relevant in the sense that it still happens today. This type of thing still happens today. There are leaders, and I didn't say mainstream media or elected and appointed officials. I'll let you connect all the dots you want. <laughs> but there are those that they have, they write their own narrative. They have their own narrative. And they reject anything and everything that challenges their narrative. They reject and deny all the evidence, even reality itself that shows otherwise. And anyone who questions or raises valid considerations about their narrative, they cast out. Isn't that what they did? Have you ever noticed on social media it's still happening today? Well, let's see. This might be part of 11 because it's their method of operation. It's the way they do things. And Jesus warned his followers, beware of the leaven of these leaders. Ultimately, they, re they rejected, they denied Jesus. They rejected and denied his person, his teaching, his work. All three of these, and any one of these three, are critical to defining false and erroneous teaching and all three are essential to our personal faith. So I want us to briefly look at these three 
and it will be a brief look. But I want you to know that just because we're taking a brief look, <coughs> Scripture is redundant with information about these three things, the person of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus, and it brings out how all of these are critical to our personal faith. So I want us first look at the person, the nature of Jesus, the one who is 100% man. But he's also, com he is completely human, but at the same time, he's 100% God. Let's take a look at what John 10, verse 24 and 29, let's, let's read about their response to this. How did, how did these religious leaders respond to Jesus? In verse 24, it says, Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. They're the ones that brought this question to be, surrounded him. He answers them. It's in verses 29 to 33. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which one of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. They didn't want to hear what he had to say. They just rejected it. Have, have we noticed that both the Old Testament and the New Testament declare that Christ, the divinity of Christ, we're coming into the holiday seasons, we'll be looking at Isaiah 9, 6. You'll be hearing it, you'll be remembering it. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and the name will be called, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That describes who he is. John 1.1, 1, 1, and then again in Hebrews, it declares, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we see that this understanding and belief is essential to our faith. Remember when Philip won the Ethiopian treasurer, went and met him, began to explain Isaiah 53 to him, and, and the man saw water and asked if he could be baptized, and Philip answered, it said, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's essential to our faith that we believe Jesus is God. Remember these religious leaders, they continually rejected Jesus' teaching. They just were done with it. They wouldn't listen to it. But Jesus said this, it's found in John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and manifest myself to him. That's Jesus' response to those that love his word, love his teaching, keep it. And to the religious leaders, Jesus on the cross, his death on the cross, for them that was a seemingly their victory over a challenge to their narrative. That's where they left it. But the cross brings us victory. Do we remember what Paul says to the Corinthians? Chapter 1, 17 and 18, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jesus warned about the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He warned about those who write their own narrative and reject every challenge to it, even to casting out those with questions or valid concerns. Scripture tells us about the person, the teaching, and the finished work of Christ and how these are essential to our faith. But it all boils down to your own personal response. 
Maybe to remind you of that and challenge you in that a little bit, I want you to listen to um, some folks that were a part of Focus on the Family's True You. And as they share this question, this about who do you say Jesus is, so I'll let you remember that for a moment. I've shared all these things to let you ponder some realities of that question. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, who do you say Jesus is? You say that he's the Son of God, who is God? Maybe there's someone here this morning that you want to accept Christ. You want this one that is offering forgiveness for your sins because he's paid the price for my sins and yours and those of the whole world but you need to accept him. So if there's anyone here this morning that you want to accept Christ, you want to make it personal, raise your hand. If you want to talk about it more, raise your hand. And maybe there's some that... Sometimes you struggle with believing that Jesus is God. And you just need help. Remember there was a man that said to Jesus, I believe but help my unbelief. Maybe there's some that need help with their unbelief. Amen. Do we embrace his teachings? Do we keep his commandments? Remember, these are the ones that love him. Maybe we need some help. Remember, Jesus said that his yoke was easy and his burden was light. Maybe you need some help. You need to say to him, Lord, help me. I'm struggling with what I'm carrying. Help me today. Remember the cross is a finished work. It's a finished work of atonement. It doesn't need any additional supplement. Maybe you need to remember that he took our sins and he gave us his righteousness. We're wearing his righteousness, not our own. Sometimes it helps us to remember that. And so, Father, I thank you for giving your son. I thank you, Jesus, for who you are, for what you've taught us, and for the finished work of atonement that's been made. Help us, Lord, to recognize, Lord, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Lord, help us to recognize, Lord, those that are writing their own narrative rejecting evidence, and ultimately denying you. Help us, Lord, to be able to define and expose error by those things that deny your person, those things that deny your teaching, and those things that deny your finished work. Help us, Lord, to know you in a greater way. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you.